So we've now seen that the key to solving linear systems is reduced, well reduced the matrix, the augmented matrix, to an echelon form. Again, RREF is sort of like the ideal, but we can actually get away with it for any echelon form. So how do we actually accomplish that? We need an algorithm uh, that is a, a process we can follow step by step, which when followed correctly will always lead us to some echelon form. And we can actually do this recursively. Recursively meaning that uh, the next step is dependent upon you know, smaller cases, right? Uh, we can kind of work step by step through a matrix. And this is gonna happen by looking for pivots inside of the matrix. And that's actually why we call them pivots. If you think of it like a basketball analogy, right? If you're playing the game of basketball, put your, you're, if you're holding the ball right, you can't just run around with the ball. It's supposed to be dribbled. But if, you've, if you stop dribbling, you kind of have to pivot. You keep one foot fixed on the ground and the rest of your body can turn around that pivot so that you can either shoot the ball, pass to a team member, uh, or, or something like that, right? And the idea is the, the whole matrix is going to be pivoting around the number we're focusing on, the, the, the so-called pivot position. Now, once the pivot is done, you'll then pass the basketball to a different player who will then pivot around. And so as the pivots kind of move throughout the matrix, we can use that algorithm to help us row reduce, row reduce, row reduce the matrix along the way. And this process is referred to as Gaussian elimination. And let me explain to you step by step what we're going to do. So if you take a, uh, we'll use an example right here, uh, this three by six matrix, it's got a three by five coefficient matrix. It, this matrix would correspond to a system of linear equations, right? So what you're gonna do is the step one, you're gonna look for the leftmost column. Uh, that is look for a column that contains non-zeros entries in it. The, the number itself could be zero, right? But look for a column, right? You'll notice there's some non-zero entries below it. So we look for the leftmost non-zero column. You might ask, if there is no non-zero columns, what do you do? Well, if there's no non-zero columns, that means every column is a zero column. You're in the zero matrix. The zero matrix is an echelon form, so you're done. Uh, it's kind of a weird situation, but you know, it's it's no big deal. So we only have to worry about row reduction when you have, no, you have a non-zero column. So look for the first non-zero column on the left. It's oftentimes gonna be the first column. And then you're gonna place a pivot position in the top row of that column. So here we get a zero. Now for our pivot positions, for our pivot here, we need something non-zero to be in the pivot position. This is why we were looking for the leftmost non-zero column. Now, in order to get something non-zero in that zero position, typically you're gonna to want to do interchange. That is just swap the row, uh, the zero row, sorry, the zero position with something non-zero below it. So for example, let's just take the first two rows and interchange them. So we're gonna swap them. So row two is gonna come up here and become row one. And row one, is gonna come down and become row two. So we just switch the rows. That's what interchange does. Now, throughout this whole situation, the pivot position didn't change. Although the pivot entry does change, the number in the pivot position does change based upon the interchange we just did. Now that we have a non-zero entry in the pivot position, what we're gonna do is we wanna then zero out everything below it, which we already have a zero in the second row. That's great. Uh, we don't have a zero in the third row, so that's our target right here. How do we cancel out a four using multiples of two? Well, we, what we can do to accomplish this is we're gonna take row three and we're gonna to add to it two times row, uh, row one. Notice what happens here. If I take negative two and I times it by two, uh, that's gonna give us a negative four. Negative four plus four is gonna give zero, so then I'll cancel it out. But then we have to do that for the rest of the row. If you take negative four times two, that's a negative eight. Negative two times negative, sorry, positive two times negative six, that's a negative 12. Two times one is a two. Negative one times two is a negative two. And then negative three times two is a negative six. Do pay attention to the signs. Uh, you're gonna notice here that when you combine these things together, zero or four and negative four gives you zero. Eight and negative eight cancels out, give you another zero. 12 and negative 12 also gives you zeros, lots of zeros here, right? Uh, finally, something non-zero, one plus two gives you a three right here. And then lastly, two, negative two and negative two gives you a negative four. And that's the last for the coefficient matrix. We have to also do the last column. 16 and negative six gives you a 10, uh, which gives you this right here. 
So we've now, now looking at the first column, if you look at just the first column and you ignore the rest of the matrix here, this column now looks like what it's supposed to be in if it were in echelon form. Um, the pivot position is identified. We need zeros below the pivot. That's what we're trying to construct. To be an echelon form, we don't have to have a one there. And we could, we could have divided the first row by two, uh, a negative two, but I don't really wanna do that because there are some odd numbers. That is numbers not divisible by two. If I started dividing by negative two, I would have gotten some fractions and I don't really wanna do that unless I really have to. So I'm just gonna delay doing that for now. And so then when you look at the first row, we're done, right? Negative two, a zero, zero, that's all we need. So because of that, we're gonna move our pivot to the next position, right? But when you look for the next pivot, let me back up for a second, you do this recursively. To find the next pivot, you ignore, you ignore the column, you ignore the column and row for which the previous pivot was located in. So you look at just this sub matrix. You look only inside of this matrix right here and you look for the leftmost column. Well, it's not that one, it's not that one. It's actually gonna be the fourth column that we find something non-zero right here. So it's in this position so, this, so now our, our new pivot position is going to be in the 2, 4 position. Let me kind of erase this and clean it up a little bit. So our pivots, we have the original pivot position in 1, 1, but then the next pivot is going to be here in 2, 4. Remember, we ignore the first, we, we ignore pivot rows and columns when we look for the new pivot. So the rest of the problem is going to be focused around this point right here, at least for the next little while. Uh, now, this, this pivot position has to be a non-zero number, which we do have that. Uh, it's already a negative two, so no interchange was necessary. Uh, the next thing to do is then to do some type of row replacement. We want to cancel out some things below it. And so in this situation, you know, we, how, do you, how do you cancel out a three with a negative two? Well, the answer is kind of always going to be clear. You're just going to take row three, and then you're going to add to it the reason I'm adding is because this is a positive and this is already a negative, so I don't need to, I don't need to multiply anything by negative here. But we're just going to take 3 divided by 2 times R2. Basically, I took on top the number I need and I divide it by the number I have, right? So another way of thinking about this is really you're always going to subtract this thing. Always going to subtract this thing, but then I divide it by negative two. So it's a double negative. It'll simplify in that regard. So I'm going to think of it as a double negative right there. It's a positive. And so that's how we're going to proceed. So therefore, if you take three halves times negative two, you're going to get a negative three. Those guys are going to cancel out. Do that for the next piece. You're going to get a nine halves. You're going to combine that with a negative four. Uh, really not a whole lot you can do about that one, just except deal with the fractions there. And then you're going to have a negative 7, uh, which times by 3 halves. It's going to give you negative 21 halves like so. All right. So now you have to kind of just deal with the fractions as they are. The 3 minus 3 will cancel out, thus giving us a 0 down here. Uh, the fractions on the other spots are, are somewhat unavoidable because you're going to get 9 halves with negative 4. Negative 4 is the same thing as negative 8 halves, which combines together to give us a positive 1 half. That's not so bad. And then you're going to take negative 21 halves, combine it with 10, which is 20 halves. That combines to give us a negative 1 half. And now, that then we will look at this row right here, this, uh, this column, excuse me. The pivot position here, everything below it is now a 0. So now we're now done with that row. So ignoring, I mean, our pivots, we had a pivot in the 1, 1 and the 2, 4 position. Ignoring the pivot rows and columns, uh, whoops, like so, we now search for the leftmost non-zero column. That's going to be the 1 half right here. This is our final pivot position. But as everything below it is already, well, there's nothing below it, this is now in echelon form. So kind of backing up right here, this matrix we now see is in echelon form. This is a matrix of rank three. There's three pivots in this matrix. It's an echelon form. So once you find echelon form, Gaussian elimination says, then convert the matrix back into a system of equations and then solve this system of equations by back substitution. So to solve for X5, divide both sides by one half and you'll end up with X equals negative one. I should say X5 equals negative one there. 
You're then going to take negative 1 and plug it into this equation right here. So we see that negative 2x to the 4, uh, 2x4 plus uh, 3 times negative 1 equals negative 7. We're going to get negative 2x to the 4th minus 3 equals negative 7. Add 3 to both sides. Two, uh, negative 2x to the 4th. Like I said, if you add 3 to both sides, you get negative 4. Divide by negative 2. x to the 4th equals positive 2. Uh, that gives us our second value right there. Uh, then with x4 and x5, we're then going to plug those into this spot in the equation here. And so what we see here is we get negative 2x1 minus 4x2 minus 6x3. We're going to get plus 2. We're going to get minus minus 1, so that's a plus 1 equals negative 3. Uh, notice these things add up together to give us a 3. If you subtract 3 from both sides, you're going to get a negative 6 on the other side. Negative 2x1 minus 4x2 minus 6x3. Uh, this is equal to negative 6. And now if I solve for x1, because now you have three variables left, but this is your last equation. What this tells us is that there's no restriction placed on x2 and x3. Notice in the previous matrix, right, the second and third columns were non-pivot columns. These will correspond to free variables. So this matrix would have multiple solutions here. So continuing to solve for x1 here, you're going to get that x1 equals positive 2x2, positive 3x3, and then minus 3. I also took the liberty of dividing by 2. Actually, I think I might have got a little ahead of myself there. So let me, let me actually try that again here negative 2 right here. So when you move the x to the other side, you'll get a positive 4x2. Uh, then you'll also have a positive 6x3, and you'll have a negative 6. Now when you divide by the negative 2, you get x1 equals negative 2x2 uh, minus 3x3 and a positive 3. So this is what your solution would look like. Uh, you're, you're generally speaking, let's say that x2 is the number s, and x3 is the number t. What we're going to see then as our solution is that x1 looks like negative 2s minus 3t plus 3. Um, x2 is s, x3 is t. x4 is actually a number 2. And x5 is a specific number. It was negative 1. And so our solution, our general solution would look like this. There are two free variables in play here. But we were able to solve this system of equation using back substitution, using this technique of Gaussian elimination. We can always solve this, we can always solve systems of equations using uh, this type of Gaussian elimination.